evening, everybody. His Excellency, the Israeli Ambassador, Shmuel Ben Shmuel, Harry Trigabov, JNF Patron, Peter Smoller, JNF National President, Pem, Trial President, New South Wales, Dan Springer, JNF Australia CEO, board members, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be here. My wife, Orit, and myself have found a warm and welcoming community here in beautiful Sydney. And I feel I am among friends tonight. Strange as it may sound, I am not here tonight to speak about Israel. Rather, I have come to speak about Am Israel, the Jewish people. I can do this here because JNF Australia has always demonstrated its recognition of one simple truth, that Israel's future is a responsibility of all Jews. We share one destiny. The success of JNF Australia's projects in Israel is a success of all of the Jewish people. I was born the same year as the State of Israel, as an immigrant child from Iran at age nine, I arrived in an Israel which was suffering severe financial hardship. My father, who was a school principal in Tehran, was suddenly unemployed. I went to work at age 11 and was sent to a boarding school far from home at age 14 because education was so important to my parents. I was able to return home only every three months. And yet, my father always told me, everything is for the best. I learned that Israel is a country where everything is possible. My father was a Zionist and was prepared to pay any price for his children to be Israelis and be at home in Israel. And so you can just imagine my father's pride when he saw his son become IDF chief of staff. During my 36 years in the IDF, especially when I was chief of staff and then for 12 years in government, our sages instruction, Ubacharta Bachaim, choose life, echoed not only in my mind, but behind every decision and action taken by the IDF and by the government. The ultimate example is the Entebbe rescue operation. Other Israeli operations may have been more complex than Entebbe, but this is the one that takes our breath away. Overnight, it proved dramatically to the people in Israel and to the entire world that no distance is too great, no operation too complicated to protect our people. Both Israeli leaders and soldiers gave life to the Talmudic dictum called Israel Arevim Zelaze. All Jews are responsible for one another. But there is more. This operation required bold decisions, real-time coordination between the Rabin government and the IDF, courage, imagination, and perfect execution. Each person showed daring way beyond his rank and position. I commanded the four armored personnel carriers which responded to the Ugandan military destroyed the MiGs in the field, 
isolated the military terminal from reinforcements and helped free the hostages. At the end of the operation, we provided our forces with cover so the hostages could be evacuated. We loaded the Hercules and left Nairobi where we could refuel and fly home. Keep in mind that before we set out, we were missing significant pieces of intelligence. We had no alternate escape plans and we were running out of time. When we left Israel, the cabinet hadn't yet approved the mission. And if the operation would be aborted, we would have to return before we reached the halfway point to Entebbe so that there would be enough fuel to fly home. On the way there, we talked, we checked our watches, and we asked ourselves, would the cabinet approve or would it not approve? When the announcement came over the speakers that the operation was on, suddenly there was complete silence on the plan. Each one reviewed his assignment, carefully checked his equipment, making sure everything was perfectly ready. Back in Israel, Rabin had prepared a resignation letter if, God forbid, the operation would fail. By approving this plan, he showed courageous leadership, fulfilling our promise to the, Jew to the Jewish people, as did Defense Minister Shimon Peres. But it was still more than that. Our intelligence had discovered that we were German terrorists among the other terrorists who once again isolated Jews just because they were Jews. They were repeating the deadly anti-Semitism of just 30 years before. We were now a sovereign and free people with our own army. There was unspoken, absolute response within each of us. Never again. Never again. So with God's help, the Entebbe mission succeeded, rescuing 102 of the 106 hostages, we mourn the lost hostages and our dear heroic commander, Yoni Netanyahu. In Israel, the entire operation became known as Operation Yonatan. To this day, the word Entebbe makes every Jew in the world stand a bit straighter, a bit taller. In our national lexicon, Entebbe symbolizes the best of the IDF its courage, its values, and its integrity. Many of you might be wondering what it was like to be a part of such critical operation. What was I feeling? I have to tell you that when you are in a situation like this, there is no choice you have to be 100% focused on your mission. All your instincts, all your senses, all your thinking is on the job you have to do. You do not, you must not feel anything else. I knew my soldiers and my officers and they knew me. I knew what was at stake. Each of these elite soldiers knew how to perform in a mission like this. I knew that every man there would give his life for me as I would for him. 
At any moment, we could be shot, or the soldiers next to us, or the hostages could be murdered. Therefore, I concentrated on one thing, that the operation would succeed. Lives depend on it. Afterwards, on the plan back, there was perfect silence. We knew the operation had been successful, and we knew the price that had been paid. Each of us told in word, in private, in private thoughts, in quiet respect, and yes, feelings. Just recently, as you know, I returned to Uganda for the first time since the rescue 40 years ago. This time, the Ugandan military secured the area for the Prime Minister of Israel and the commanders of the operation. The military observation tower where Yoni Netanyahu was killed was still there with all the gunshot holes from 40 years ago. We have the perspective of decades. I knew one thing quite clearly. We would do it again if God forbid there is a need, we will do it again. Choosing life was also the fight against the Second Intifada, where I led the IDF in the war against suicide bombers, who welcomed death just to murder, to murder in innocence. We fought this unthinkable mindset because we Jews sanctify life. I am also proud that as the chief of staff, I initiated the Atidim Futures Program, which gave soldiers from the periphery an equal opportunity to receive a higher education before or after their service. Today, there are more than 50,000 students and 8,000 graduates, and they are changing Israel society. Dear friends, against all odds, the achievement of this tiny state in just a little more than six decades are unparalleled by any other country in the history of mankind. Israel has accomplished this while at the same time fighting enemies on every front. And yet, Israel flourishes. We have paid a heavy price I remember the moments of agonizing decisions, the pain of losing beautiful young soldiers, each one like a son to me. Never was there an army like this whose soldiers want peace more than anything else. Yet, find courage on the fields of battle. I fought in five wars. As commander, I visited my wounded soldiers in hospitals and went to the funerals of young men, so young. And I tried to find the words to comfort their families. The only thing that has kept us going is that Israel and the entire Jewish nation completely depend on us to safeguard their homeland. And when Israel is strong, the entire Jewish world is strong too. With all this in mind, I offer the following brief analysis. The dramatic changes during the past five years are impacting the entire Middle East as well as Europe and Western countries. The main threats include the fragmentation and dismantling of countries such as Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen. Ongoing civil war and genocide in Syria has led to a massive wave of refugees in all directions. Among them, hundreds or even thousands 
of radical Islamic terrorists exploit the openness of the West and enter in sleeper cells ready at any time to receive orders and go into action. The rise of ISIS, the extreme Sunni Islamic group that seeks to forcefully impose a worldwide Sharia-based radical Islamic state to implement 7th century culture using 21st century tools. ISIS will continue to spread and will continue to terrorize in the West and in Sunni countries, including suicide and mega terror attacks. And it is a very dangerous threat to Israel. Iran and the Iran deal. There is no doubt that Iran is a dangerous, destabilizing factor in the region and a serious threat to Israel. Iran seeks regional domination by funding, organizing, and directing terror directly and through proxies such as Hezbollah in Lebanon and recently in Syria, Houthis in Yemen, and Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Hamas continue to control Gaza, preventing humanitarian aid from reaching the Palestinians. It continues to build attack tunnels against Israel towns. Hezbollah continues to receive from Iran long-range missiles to reach Israel. According to our intelligence, at last count, they had 150,000 of these missiles threatening the state of Israel. No Western country seriously believes that Iran will stop its nuclear development. It continues enriching its uranium resources. It has retained its non-conventional infrastructure and long-range ballistic capabilities. And the threat to Israel is enormous. In the latest wave of terror in Israel, individual terrorists murder or attempt to murder on an almost daily basis in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and in Judea and Samaria, while the terrorist powers insist that these are not organized attacks. Make no mistake, the incitement motivating these individual attacks is well organized by the Palestinians in their kindergartens, schools, mosques, and media, poisoning the hearts and the mind of the young Palestinian generation, which bring us to the non-stop anti-Israeli incitement and BDS. Well-funded and internationally organized, BDS is a new anti-Semitism. It calls for the delegitimization and destruction of Israel through economic attrition and repeats the lies of historical anti-Semitism. The inciters portray Israel as Goliath when really Israel is David, living in a very tough neighborhood. So, what do we do? First, as for the infiltration of terrorist sleeper cells into Western countries, Western leaders have to consider the balance between freedom and openness on one hand, and their commitment to protect their people on the other. Israel is ready to support our allies in the West in this effort and to share the experience and the technology that we have used for two decades. Second, regarding the rise of ISIS, don't be mistaken. Their ultimate goal is Jerusalem and Israel. And the Western countries must understand that we won't be able to stop this from the air, it will have 
to be a ground action. We, I mean Israel and the Western countries as well, we must create an alliance of moderates to coordinate the correct strategic steps, including reopening negotiations without preconditions between Israel and the Palestinians for a two-state solution. My dear friends, it is against our Jewish values to rule over other nations. And we cannot, we cannot risk losing our Jewish majority in one state solution. At the same time, Israel must deal effectively with the terror attacks on our citizens, both on the political diplomatic front as well as on the military front. This is our supreme commitment to our people. Do you remember the brutal Passover massacre of 2002 during the Second Intifada? During that month, more than 135 Israelis, mostly civilians, had been murdered by terrorist attacks. As IDF Chief of Staff, I told Prime Minister Ariel Sharon that we must return to all West Bank cities, arrest the terrorists, and destroy their infrastructure. The Israeli government ordered the immediate mobilization of more than 40,000 reservists in an emergency call-up, and the following day launched the counter-terrorism operation, Operation Defensive Shield, in the West Bank. A day after, we decided to build a security fence, and two years later, we built it. On the other hand, I remember sitting across President Barack Obama in June 2012, and emphasizing to him point blank that he has to influence the Palestinians to stop the incitement and the terror it causes and work seriously on negotiations for a two-state solution. Third, the Iran deal. Western countries and Israel must act as gatekeepers in order to make sure that Iran is implementing the agreement by the book. This, include, this includes systematic inspection of their military installations and monitoring the Iranian Revolutionary Guard in the countries where Iran terror is involved and they are involved. The big question is, what will the world and Israel do if Iran violates the agreement? The world powers, led by superpower US, must prepare a military option. This military solution should only be a last resort. But the Iranians should be aware that this option exists and that it is a very serious option. Fourth, the recent individual terror attacks in Israel are a direct result of our neighbors' incitement and must be handled more effectively. We must act to prevent and to respond successfully, just as we fought against any other terror. Fifth, regarding worldwide incitement and BDS, BDS has to be countered in the universities and among current Western leaders in a loud and united voice. This has to be done before today's university students become tomorrow's decision makers of nations. Last, but certainly not least, Israel must remain strong. As both former Defense Minister and IDF Chief of Staff, I can assure you that along with our allies, we will use every diplomatic and political avenue. Only if this fails, 
then we must be prepared to act decisively with military power. We will never jeopardize the security of the state of Israel. If our enemies attack, we have to win. We cannot afford to lose even one war. But we also have a secret weapon, and that is you, my friends, supporting, innovating, developing, building, and being a part of the story. When we say that Israel must be strong, when we say that Israel chooses life, we are not only talking about survival. We are talking about developing and sustaining a vibrant, creative, and productive life for Israel's future. In this context, the commitment to Israel of JNF Australia is essential. The Negev, your focus this evening, is after all one of Israel's two frontiers. As far back as Ben Gurion, Israel has recognized that this is our future. Therefore, every project that JNF Australia undertakes in the Negev is a life-giving force for the entire country. When I visited Ofakim, I was not only deeply impressed by the dramatic physical renewal, but I could also feel the renewed energy and optimism of the people. In fact, populating, developing, and sustaining the Negev is no less than a national mission that JNF shares with the Israel government and with its defense forces. I was privileged to lay the cornerstone for the Ir Habadim military base which the IDF relocated to the Negev. As defense minister, I initiated the Nevatim airport there. We did this out of clear recognition of the vital importance of the Negev. Thus, while the IDF secures Israel for its safety, GNF Australia secures Israel for its growth. Together, that spells future, and it is an unbeatable combination. My friends, individually, each of us can make a small differences, but together we can move mountains. Together we can hand down to our children and grandchildren a strong and secure, thriving and dynamic Israel. Israel is the Jewish people. May you go from strength to strength in this holy war, and may our collective prayer be answered. Sim shalom tova ubracha, chen bachesed brachamim, aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael amecha, ve'nomar amen. May God grant peace to all of Israel. Allow me to publicly thank my wife for it. As a wife of one who served the State of Israel for 48 years, she has led an intensive life, moving family 15 times in order to keep them near my place of service. Orit has kept the family close and has been a true Eshet Chaim, woman of valor in Israel. Thank you, Orit, and thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.